Barcelona. We are ready for our first panel of the day. And we couldn't get better start than here with my life with John Avon. And I have a great host for you for this panel. Please, I want to hear a warm welcome for Sam Gallio. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Good morning, my name is Sam. I run the YouTube channel Ristic Studies, and my videos are about the art, history, and culture of magic. And I have a short story for you to start this panel. Um, about seven or eight years ago, I started working on a video series that covered specific magic artists and their portfolios. Um, and at that time, I had done three or four videos of this style. In the back of my mind, I was like, one day I'd love to talk about John Avon's work. Um, so I gathered the courage. I wanted to make sure I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to get good at the graphics, the storytelling, the writing. And I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak about John Avon. But part of my process is, first things first, I have to email John and ask him, hey, is it okay if I make a video about your work? So I gather the courage, and I type up an email, and I send it over. And within a couple of hours, I had an enthusiastic, yes, please do, be my guest. And if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. So I got the green lights. I made the videos. I did two videos on John Avon's work. Um, and again, that was about eight years ago. Fast forward, fast forward to about three months ago, we were rehearsing for this panel. Um, and I get on a Zoom call. And it's me, and it's Rich Hagon, a couple other people that work on the production team, and John. And I say, hi, John, I'm Sam. And he like looks up and he looks at me and he said, are you that bloke that made those beautiful videos about my work like eight years ago? And I'm like, in what world do you remember that, you know? But it really spoke to just how much John is appreciative of magic and the community to remember something as small like that from almost a decade ago. So it's really come full circle. Now I'm speaking with John about his life and his work in magic, and I couldn't be more honored from a personal standpoint um, to do that. So thank you again for joining, and please give a warm welcome to John Avon. I'm so excited for you to have him. Good morning, John. I'm so glad you're here. Um, we'd like to just start from the very beginning. I'd like you to just tell me a little bit about what got you into painting and your earliest memories of, uh, of painting. Is my microphone working? Yep, it sure Good. should be. <laughs> there are some people out there. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, it will take me a while to get used to talking like this because I've been on stage before, but normally with a guitar. Okay. And I don't normally open my mouth, so... Bear with me and I'll warm up. Of course. So, um, so yeah, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask just, do you remember your earliest memories of, of painting and what drew you to art? Um, my sister and I used to paint and draw and I found that it was one of the few things I could do where I could find, um, I, could, I could find myself and I wouldn't be anything to do with school. So when I painted pictures, I'll be doing it for myself. Lovely. I remember seeing the first image of, um, of you. There's a couple of uh, <laughs> shots of John through the years. This is the one that, I, uh, that we discussed, um, your first ever oil painting. Um, yes. it's, a bit, it's a bit more abstract than what you're working with now, but... Yeah, well, that's the second painting I ever did, because the first one was completely red, and I got told off that kindergarten school because it was just red <laughs> and, and my, my dad bless him collected everything I ever did and um, there's this f four files about that wide of my entire life up until when I went to art college it all went into the book so it was amazing of him to collect that and this one literally is I mean it's a elephant attacking the sun sounds like a rock band <laughs> does it? Maybe. Maybe. Sounds yeah. It's probably there. I'll go on a Google search. <laughs> yes, there's a band called that. Oh, okay, good. There isn't. <coughs> and how about this? This is the Green Stick Man. Do you remember about how old you are when you were working on these? Uh, no. No? <laughs> I was just very, very small. I used to steal my sister's felt pens. In fact, I used to be in awe of my sister because she could draw better than me. And then she just stopped. 
But um, actually, a lot of these are to do with war. So, because um, I grew up with my father collecting memorabilia from the Second and the First World War, so a lot of my really early stuff had sort of aircraft and battleships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, I think as a young child, I remember drawing dinosaurs quite a bit. That was kind of where I lived in terms mm. of you know the quick sketches. It's and okay. Things. <laughs> Thank you. That's, Thank you. That's We're here they, together today. That's so why they had therapy. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Tell me about your first dinosaur drawing. But already by age five, you could see that uh, we actually boats. have yeah we have some physical shapes yeah. and you know. So the boats were um, at my grandmother's house overlooking the sea. I used to see lots of boats, so I drew boats. Yeah, it's not rocket science. <laughs> so boats, crayons, <laughs> boats, draw boats. I just drew lots of them. Yeah, don't know why. That's the perfectionist in me. And so, as you're drawing early on. Um, and you're starting to find your interests. I know we mentioned music. You and I both play the guitar. Um, yep. And you started painting and drawing. Eventually, you have to come to this decision everyone does, where you're like, oh, well, what am I going to do with the rest of forever? What am I going to do professionally? The rest of forever. Yeah, <laughs> the rest of forever, <laughs> for, which for keeps the rest on of coming. So. <laughs> multiple um, lives I'll be reborn into. <laughs> do you remember that decision for you, kind of the crossroads decision of what drew you to kind of start pursuing painting professionally? Um, that's a very good point. So when I was at school, I was extremely uncool and I was bullied because of my name, which we'll get back to later maybe. And the only thing I could ever do that seemed to elevate my self-esteem from here to here was the fact I could draw and paint. So um, to answer your question, when I was bullied at school, I was aware that when I did pictures, they started to quieten down, so I earned their respect by making pictures. So I suppose I hang, hung, hung on to that as a way to get some kind of self-esteem going. And then I was aware I could do, when friends and family would come around and see these strange images, that I can see here, by the way, um, people seemed to go, gosh, that's cool. And I suppose it just seemed logical I would go in that direction. Though my father, he had a building business which had four generations of Avon and it was deemed that I would go into the family business and become the son of a building contractor. And um, my father was quite happy for me not to do that, I think, because his life was so hard. So my parents just encouraged me to do whatever I wanted. So it's very cool of them. Of course. I'm sounding American, I'm saying cool. <laughs> it was very cool. Oh, ah, there is the picture. Yeah. Okay, that, can we all see that black and white one? Sure. Yeah, this yeah? is the four generations of Avon. Yeah. This is an amazing photo. I, I yeah, love this photo you talked so to me about. That's my dad, bottom left, his father, top right, his father's father, and his father's father's father. Wow. Yeah. And when I saw that photograph, I said to my mum, that can't be true. <laughs> it is true. But wow. how, how cool is that? Yeah. So Ernest Avon and Son Limited goes right back to that ancient man in the middle. And I was the first one not to carry on the family business. That's kind of tr tricky to not um, carry on with that tradition. Mm. Um, I know there's always pressure to do that. Um, but you felt confident that painting is where you found Zen and where you, where you really found a lot of your identity. Um, well, yeah. Confidence is probably the wrong word, but it gave me some sense of that I could do something that other people couldn't. It sounds like a very negative thing, but it's true. I was, I was terrible at school. Um, my school reports all said, could do better, could do better. And apart from art, it was, yes, <laughs> <laughs> could do better. <laughs> so, ah, that is me with my ethics kits. <laughs> So it was art, and um, uh, this is an affinity you and I have. I, we can't help Guitars. but... Uh, that was my first gig in Brighton. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and uh, this is, what is this? Uh, this is a Les Paul of some sort. It looks beautiful. That's a Les Paul copy that constantly went, went out of tune. So I did a big bend on the guitar. Oh. Like, so that is a terrible guitar, and I've still got it. But, um, <laughs> but it looks good. <laughs> I did have those jeans up until a few years ago, but I'm a little bit wider now. <laughs> as you get older, you... Of anyway, course. let's not go there. 
So slowly but surely you start to develop painting. Um, we passed by one of your paintings from college. Uh, what about this studio here? This is uh, your studio ah, in Sharpline. So, yeah, Sharpline Studio. So that ball thing on the desk. Um, so when I, um, when I was doing lots of book covers, because the reference you had to get from reference books or you took photographs, so that blob in the middle is a beach ball with wire meshing around and, and plasticine over the top, which was the planet for the Arthur C. Clarke painting Hammer of God. Wow, cool. And I've just remembered that's what that is. So if I did a painting in those days, I would build a model. And I'd just read, I'd started reading Arthur C. Clarke. And in the mid to late 80s, I'm lying on a great big button here. In the mid to late 80s, I started to become very well known doing book covers. And there's Stephen King, Arthur C. Clarke, and Terry Pratchett. And I'd made it. Yeah. I was there. Yeah. So this was before you could just Google image uh, references you had to build. Yeah references yourself or go out in the world, God I forbid. I used to go to a model shop and buy airfix kits and combine them completely wrongly. And the spaceship on the front of the Hammer of God has got three soap dishes, but I'm waffling. Let's, um, yeah, let's, let's move on quickly. Well, let's look at the first book cover because this is a big moment in your career. You're developing and you're deciding to, to pursue your, artist as, or your, your career as a, as a working professional artist. And this is one of those first breakthroughs for you, right? So this mm. is Waterhole by Julian Severin. Um, and I, there's a lovely story attached to this, to this book cover. It's kind of silly but lovely. So, yes, I went up to London and this art director took a chance on me. That sounds like a song. That's terrible. Just edit that bit out. <laughs> we have a lot of songs to write after. We you know? have a, a snake covered in bullets and we want it in a week's time. So, yes. So I went home and did a snake covered in bullets. And then the, it was printed. And I found out it was in WH Smith's in the high street in Penarth in South Wales. So my mum and I went up there and it was there. And my mum grabbed a book, went up to the checkout lady and said, my son did this, can we have it for free? <laughs> and I think the lady told my mum to, uh, I can't swear. But yeah, she just assumed that because I'd done it. And no one gave her a damn in the shop. You know, so, uh, sorry. But yeah, this is my first book cover. Yeah, wow. I think that shows just, uh, you know, your mum was proud in that moment and wanted to fight and say, hey, yeah, my son did this book cover. And, and we have my it. name was on the back as small as possible. Nonetheless, it but, was on the back. But this was your, also your first time seeing your art printed in the yep. wilds with other people to see. Well, so. Honestly, it was a seminal moment when I, I'd been going to this bookshop since I was tiny, and there was the book, and there was my name, tiny as possible, you know, smallest font, but it was there. Why it has to be as small as possible, I don't know. But yeah, not fair. The life of an artist. <laughs> life is an Keep artist. Keep him down. So during this era, I mean, the, your main work was in, was in book covers. That's where a lot yeah. of your clients came from. And um, I did a lot of horror book covers. <laughs> yeah. So this is a good point to talk about the faces. So in my profession, you get typecast, like I was typecast, typecast for Magic the Gathering doing lands. Um, for about a year and a half, I was the man who did faces with airbrushes just because so, I did a book cover with a face and it went down very well and another publisher uh, put my phone down another publisher saw it and phoned me up and said can you do me the same sort of thing I said yes and then a year and a half later so I'd done about 10 faces because you just get typecast yeah yeah and which is fine because you're kind of making a name for yourself but then you want to untypecast yourself right so there's also a moment of resistance. You're like, gosh, I've done 15 different face covers for yes. 15 different books. And actually, I, I love these because anytime I go back in time and look there's at old sci-fi covers. Clark one. Sorry, oh yeah, the yeah. Arthur C. Clarke one. Those are this is a separation of those the face are covers, right? Soap dishes, by the way. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah. Yep, soap dishes. Very cool. <laughs> very uncool. No, it's very cool. But yeah, this is the era where a, a book cover could really, I mean, enrapture you in a certain way. Sometimes the cover was actually better than the book. You know, don't judge a book by its cover, but like these were awesome to look at. So. But the Terry Pratchett one, if we could go back to that Terry Pratchett one, 
that was an example where I couldn't flex my wings because I had a phone call. Someone said, no, the art director said, we'd like you to do Terry Pratchett. And I said, oh, I'm very busy. And, and Bill next to me said, Terry Pratchett, he's famous. <laughs> I hadn't even heard of him. So he said, take it on. So I said, okay, okay, yes, of course. <laughs> But the design, I literally had to do a gravestone with the lettering, and that's my wife's hand holding the phone. And that's an example where I could have done it a lot better, but the art director designed it very tightly, mm. which is kind of strange, but I un understand. Mm. So I kind of am proud I did it, but I don't like the cover. Does that make sense? Of course. <laughs> I think everyone who makes art knows that you're most critical of your own work, and sometimes embarrassing. I am or very critical. I know you are, but this I is why we have to celebrate you today, from right? <laughs> not critical, so mega critical. I'm volume 11. Yeah. Um, so one of the other big breakthroughs, maybe an, uh, an author that you did know by name, Stephen King at the time. Yes. So you worked on a couple of Stephen King book covers in this, in this era. And I just started re reading Stephen King. Again, that was one of those seminal moments where you get the phone call because what happens, we've all heard this name, making a name, no, this phrase, making a name for yourself. But because I became in with the art directors, they start trusting you to do the, the big important jobs. I mean, it's when I had the phone call for Stephen King, that was definitely um, scary. And because Michael Whelan had done the first one and I got to do volume two, and I had only a week to do it. Wow. And the painting is this big. And honestly, it's, um, I was staring at the carpet <laughs> thinking, how am I going to do this? Because I just like to say to audience land that a lot of my work has been driven by fear. And I'd like to say it was driven by love, but it was mostly um, driven through fear of failure, which is, sounds like a positive negative, but it's true. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure. Some people say, it must be lovely to do a job that you love. And I, I often have to lie because I don't want to upset them, but it's not that I don't love my job, it's the fact that I've, it's always been so, so hard to do mm -hmm. because of my perfectionism. Yeah, yeah. You and do, you do a job that you hard. fear in a <laughs> sense, you know? So what's it, what about this one, The Immaculate? Um, the brief for that was the art director said, we want to have a man who's just come out of a, um, a house. He's just found out that his wife's just died giving birth. And as he comes outside, all the leaves go boom. And on every leaf, there has to be a screaming face. Oh, Gr gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and they cropped half of it out. Of course. <laughs> and when I handed it in, it was rejected. Oh. <laughs> he said, it's too colorful. So I went back to the studio and I got my airbrush and just sprayed yellow over the whole thing and swore like a trooper, sent it up to London and it was liked. Oh. And then they sh only show half of it anyway. Yeah. That was really hard. Yeah, yeah. And I'm quite happy to say in public, that's the era when I started to suffer from huge anxiety because making a change, these days when you make a change digitally, you can slowly shift the colors and you can go back to the day before. In the old days, I would have had my painting that had been rejected and an airbrush. And I don't know how many of you have ever used an airbrush, but it's a visceral thing that sprays paint, so you can't just undo it. So it would have been and there's no going back. No. It's no. scary. Yeah, of course. And um, about this time, too, you start establishing, you know, making a name for yourself, if you will. Um, you establish yourself and in, in your work and your style, and you broaden your scope a little more um, with the book covers. Eventually, Magic the Gathering comes along and kind of knocks on your door. But you might not have been home at that time, is that correct? There's a, there's a moment where Magic found you, and it might not have found you at home. Yes, and um, that phrase, um, no sort of phrase, that film Sliding Doors and Fate is definitely applicable. Ah, well done whoever's doing the presentation. Yes, the Purple Mountain was the first one. So Sue Ann Harkey was in the country. She was talking to Ian Miller, who I've met through Roger Dean. And um, 
Ian said to come to the studio to see Bill. And I wasn't going in that day because I shared a space with friends. So I was just at home and I thought, I'll go into work. And there was Sue Ann meeting Bill and Bill showed her his work. And Bill said, well, I might as well see John. So I was like, hello. And I'd never heard of Magic the Gathering, so I'm not going to do an American accent. <laughs> not on stage, anyway. <laughs> and she said, would you like to do some Magic cards? I said, OK. So she said, what do you want to do? And I was so sick of doing figures. I said, have you got any mountains? She said, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I said, how much money are you paying? not knowing anything about magic and she said something and I said well can I have some more <laughs> and she said sure and I doubled the figure on the spot and Bill said good job oops <laughs> so um and I was very aware it will be printed that big so I thought I can do them this big and th those first ones were tiny but yeah I I might I wouldn't be here yeah talking to you Sam I'm so glad you are though. meeting all these lovely people that I can't see <laughs> yes <laughs> Now, th now this piece, um, Watervale Cavern, is also another moment in your career where um, expectations start to rise a little bit more. You make your name in magic and you establish a style. So Sam and I flagged this up when we were having a meeting half an hour ago. So um, in my room in the hotel over there, I think, this is quite a symbolic moment. I check into my room. I couldn't find any light switches and I couldn't even find a shower. I thought, this room's very cool, but I can't even find a shower. But all over the wall, there are these black shapes. And me being a bit of a depressive person, I thought, that's very depressing. It looks like some utopian growth. And it's very dark. But I thought, it's very cool, but why is it all this creeping darkness? A bit similar to these clouds, but it's sort of... I thought, that's very cool, but very dark and scary and threatening. So I woke up in the morning and pressed the button for the blinds to Slowly if I could find the button. <laughs> and suddenly I realized they were the shadows of trees. So I went from perceiving them as threatening to beautiful and foliage. Then I realized, of course, that's me interpreting darkness or light. So this painting is kind of similar. So I always try to get emotion into my work. So the waterfall represents hope and protection. So imagine you're behind that waterfall and the clouds are the darkness. And then you've got the foreground in the foreground. Mm -hmm. But to me, that there is darkness and threat in life. And people who try to pretend there isn't. Mm they are wrong because it is there but you can have protection but there is darkness and did i waffle beautifully no, I don't that was gorgeous okay of course. i um, could waffle for hours <laughs> <laughs> and this is something i've always found in your work um because you do a lot of landscape illustrations there is a bit of this um sort of um, environmental storytelling that comes through in your colors mm. something else that i think about is uh the zendikar mountain um which we'll get to a little bit later um but before that, there's, there's, a, there's another big moment where life intersects with art. And this, this was one of those moments. There's a serendipitous about this is the card angelic wall. Um, this is another kind of symbolic story here. So I can't remember how many years ago my father died. I apologize because I've got a health condition that makes my brain go really. And I drove back to Wales with my wife. No, she wasn't my wife at the time, my partner. <laughs> Start again. <laughs> okay, drive back to Wales with Pat. And my father was in a care home with dementia. And we had a sense he might pass away. So in those days, I had to take my paints and my airbrush and my air compressor and work at their, at their house. And in those days, I had to do these paintings in two days. There was the bit before I'd be drawing them and all the rest of it. So that painting I'd started the day before he died. And then the day he died, I finished that in the afternoon or the following day. 
So the serendipitousness Serendipity? Serendipitousness? <laughs> is the fact that that's the only painting I've ever done that's got a cremation, an angel rising up, and two men standing there looking at a cremation with the sort of classic shape in the middle. So that painting is for my dad. Wow. And it's amazing when that happens, because life does throw those things with you and at you. So it's a beautiful moment. And every, um, every magic artist I speak to, there is an element of the real life that informs the artwork. And it does come through in the details, because we don't know what's going to happen. So I, I loved this story. I loved seeing this and giving greater context to John's life, because it does that. Um, you mentioned your partner. Your partner becomes your wife, Pat. And she also shows up in a lot of your paintings as, a, does, as yes. a reference work, right? Yes, that's not my wife. OK, yeah. <laughs> that was a girl called Antonia who I was too afraid to ask out for dinner. She modeled for me, and um, anyway, let's move on quickly. Sure, of course. <laughs> Just well, erase something. that. Bit, <laughs> of course. Yes. But, but, but this is also something that features, <laughs> features with magic artists. They have to use their friends for reference, ah, ah. their wife, and this is one of your, this is for sure someone that you know, correct? Yes, this is my okay. friend Tim. <laughs> so I'm going into work on the bus, and there's this very polite lady who sat down. And she said, so John, I hear you're an artist. Tell me what you're painting today. And I thought, you really don't want to know what I'm painting today. I didn't say that. So I said, I'm painting my friend Tim, who's just discovered that his brain is on fire. He's screaming, and there's flames coming out of his mouth. <laughs> and she said, John, how are your children getting on at school? <laughs> Simple as that. Yeah. <laughs> and I love those moments because I'm a bit of a rebel. It's true, I was going in to paint that painting. And that's why I love magic, because yeah. it's crazy. And life is crazy, isn't oh, it? Yeah, it sure in is. a nice way. And it keeps going. It keeps going. Um, throughout this time, again, you're establishing your name and your style. Expectations start to become a real element to your work. Yep. And that sort of summates. Everyone that's ever played Magic will come across John's work in the unsets. The unsets were front and center featuring John's work in a unique way for the first time in the game. But I remember you mentioned that this was also kind of, well, the expectation became a real element in approaching your, um, your painting. So talk to me a little bit about managing that expectation for, for these high profile cards. Yes. So. Um I'm not saying I'm at the top of my profession, but that phrase, life is tough at the top, because I, I, don't, I don't know where I am in that one, but when you, the higher you go up in life, and then you start to become successful, the pressure and the expectation actually carries on. And it's really annoying, because when I was young, I assumed that life would get easier. It kind of does, but it also gets harder. Because when the un unhinged, I can never say that, the unhinged lands came out, which I did, by the way, tiny little ellipses with an airbrush. And they asked me to, about four years later, to spray out the corners so they were square. And then they appeared in this form. They were tiny. And we do posters this big, which is amazing that they show, but when Unstable came along, they kind of said, we want the same thing but different, but they didn't say that. But in my head, I said to myself, well, I want to do the same vibe, but I can't do the same thing. And of course, the expectation on myself was huge. Um, and again, there's fear. There's the, how do I please the art director, how do I please the people who this will matter to? And I actually terrify myself because of my own standard that's always a little bit higher than my capacity. So when I did the unstables, I got my airbrush out again and I did them by hand. Wow. Which was, I'd already done one painting by hand that was Lotus Field, I think it was called. And as I started painting them by hand, I realized why I'd given up doing them by hand. Because <laughs> you have a bad day, you can't just go, 
I'm sorry, can I go back to yesterday? It's like, oh, oh. So when I did these paintings, um, I was scared. But then when I, when I finished them, I thought, yep, they're good, good enough because they're never completed. So that's the first thing I'd like to confess, <laughs> is that whenever I send off a painting, they're never finished. Um, in fact, in the days of old, an, an artist would do a painting and then they would put it on soak for about six months or six years and then come back and finish it. So when Guy, who's over there, who's the most wonderful person in the world, when we did the book, we were going through the book to, and I was going, we can't show that because it's terrible. He said, we've got to show that, John, because to you it might be terrible, but it's famous terrible because I'm such a huge critic of my own stuff. And I'd like to say I'm not, but I am. And all the amazing artists over there are probably the same. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, you have an audience here that love your work. I love your work, and we celebrate your work, even when you're critical of it. Um, mm, I know I can speak for voice. everyone here, and if you would agree, maybe with a round of applause just to encourage you. Yeah. <laughs> Now this is, also a, this is also a funny story, I mean, being critical of your own work. So the next slide is the Invasion Forest. And the Invasion Forest is one of the most reprinted John Avon lands. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately for you, you don't like that one very much, right? <laughs> no, I do. <laughs> oh, you I, do? You love yes, this? Oh, I do. I got it I wrong. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> well, that's fine. I probably made a mistake in the brief. I take responsibility for everything. So the reason why we flagged up this painting is that it was, um, I'd taken a break from magic for about two years to do advertising because in advertising was where all the money was and I needed to earn more money because we'd had our first child and Pat gave up work and I needed to earn more money and I could not paint quickly enough. Mm. I couldn't earn enough money. Our bank balance was going south, which is there or wherever it is. So I knew some friends in advertising and said, can I do some because I want more money. Sounds like Robin Williams. So I did, I earned a lot more money, and it was very stressful. But then, after about a year, I started to think, this is very shallow, because it was, I'm earning more money, but I'm not getting any satisfaction. So I contacted the Wizards of the Coast, and they gave me the invasion lands. And the first drawing of this forest looked a bit average, and I thought, it must have more strength. So I just started to learn about the golden rectangle, which is the square with the bit on the right, which is roughly what that's doing. When I did that painting, it did feel very strong. It's very basic and limited palette. And I think what you're picking up on is the fact that the colors are very minimal. That's what I would have said. These days, I'd have very strong blue side lighting coming in on the side. So this is the era where I made everything very monochrome, but it does still work. But these days I do it a lot more differently. I'd have a powerful sort of threatening. Good. It does come up in one of the next images. Of course, yes. Yeah. Segwaying into That's something right. else. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you like it. I, I was worried you didn't. Um, yep. A lot of landscapes, a lot of um, natural forming um, rock formations and trees and islands and water. The flip side of that on Ravnica, a city covered, or a, a plain covered in city, now you have to mind architecture. So you submit this to the art director, Jeremy Jarvis, and you're very proud of it. You're like, ah, there it is. Yeah. Then what happens? So Jeremy Jarvis sends me an email saying, John, I've got a great idea. That was of Gilgate. It's very hard for me to say that. He said, I've got a great idea. Let's pan right back and show it with the city all around it. Is this the bit where I'm allowed to swear? Maybe. <laughs> it's, anyway, <laughs> so it's like, uh, 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 so it's basically that's in my profession, it's one of those moments where you realize you're in for a very long couple of weeks because when I panned right back, it meant I had to have the same thing. And because I don't use 3D modeling, I use reference. It just meant drawing the same thing, but with all the buildings around. And I suppose that's something I'm quite proud I'm able to do because yes, these are the stages of the underpainting. But the one thing I know I can do is the architecture. I just do it the very long way with layering. So the way I do my work, if you're interested, 
as I do a drawing by hand, and then this is the digital era, scan it in, and then the drawing gradually builds using layers. So because my brain can't cope with it not looking finished, I'll start with the drawing, then I put it into layers. So I've got the tonal elements there. Then I'll introduce color. Then I'll start to work in the buildings, the, the lights and the color, and I'm repeating myself. Wow. Yeah, it's but that's how I work. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And it turned out fine in the end. Yeah. It was one of those, oh, <sighs> comes for moments. Yeah, no, of course. It's <laughs> Jeremy Jarvis uh, sort of asking you, can you level up here? And you did, yes. so. Which is fine. That's what the art, we are just here to serve. You know, the art director says jump, and you jump. Yep, yes, of course. It's what we do. Um, we are guns for hire. There was a swamp from Ravnica as well that uh, also has a little bit of a narrative involved with it. So, um, so Guy um, wanted me to bring this one out because when I designed this, and I was thinking something I'd like to add about swamps is being quite a dark, slightly depressive character. Mm. Weirdly, I find doing black, dark images very cathartic because I'm, I'm a very light-hearted, fun person, but I can be very dark. So doing swamps makes me happy. Yeah. I don't know why. But also, if you look at this image, think how cool it would be to be subterranean. And just before you get to the very bottom, which is here, you've got buildings not quite reaching the bottom. And to me, having had moments in my life where I felt beyond unhappy, where you, maybe, I don't know, anyone out there has hit, reached that moment where you almost can't continue. Well. I've been there a few times, and when you're at the bottom, the good thing about that is if there's nowhere else to go, you, um, you've got one choice, you can either give up or you can keep going. The thing I like about this painting is that looking through to the light bit in front, that's where you've got people carrying on, and the tunnel to the right represents either threat or hope. Mm. So the narrative here is you can stay in the lower bits, which is fine, or you can have courage to go into the unknown and maybe find some warmth. So that's my story about that painting. I love that. Uh, I think that is, a, um, that is a decisive moment that we must cross many times. Yes, um, we all do every day. Well, every day. I do. <laughs> yes, you do. Um, the, next, uh, the next painting is kind of a tonally opposite. It is the proof that with hope, you know, better things come. And uh, this is a joyful piece. And it's not actually related to magic. So tell me a little bit about uh, the Trundle, the Trundle's quest. So I was asked to choose four pieces which were seminal moments in my career and I managed to slip in a non-magic piece. So around about that period, this period, a lot of my work was getting very monochrome because I'd be doing that tonal stage and by the time I'd be needing to add colour often it's time for the painting to fly off. So when I first designed this painting I did some colour offs and the art director said, John, we want you to gun up the colours. And I thought, oh, <laughs> <laughs> can't swear. So he said, let's have some very strong side lighting. And so he doesn't look like it from here, but yes, there's a very uh, bright blue coming in from the right. And also, there's a phrase in illustration, the illustration world called Hollywood lighting. Okay. Which is where you you've got a bright light source there, and in reality there wouldn't be another bright side, there, bright side light, but in terms of that painting you've got the warm and the cool, so I just gummed up the cool. And the, the other thing I like about this painting is, talking about the narrative bit, is it does achieve that I would like to land there for a couple of days and just wander around and explore what's behind those buildings in the front. Yeah. And that's the, na the narrative bit. It's, you can't show what's completely there, but you can hint there might be something exciting. And you can land there and I'm saying enough. Wonderful. Time yeah. for water. 
And the, yeah, and the colors and the, and the composition obviously sell that here too. Um, to me, it kind of combines what we looked at just a bit ago with, uh, with the architecture that you have to master for certain magic worlds yes. and, um, and the landscape and the atmospheric perspective that you have to incorporate for, for the landscapes. Mm. So to me, this, this is such a John Avon piece and it's, uh, and it's again, mm. it's the hopeful side of it all. So. It is. There yeah. is happiness there somehow. Somewhere... I'm not going to sing. <laughs> Moving swiftly on, Sam. Sure, of course. <laughs> um, so now, now as, um, as you've established yourself um, in magic over the years and you've come to these conventions and met a bunch of your fans um, mm. and you continue to take commissions from magic when you feel like the expectation, um, you can rise to the occasion. Mm. Um, I'd like to just kind of talk a little bit about your relationship with art you mentioned when you were young that art was a, a sort of therapeutic, meditative um, activity. Mm. And I'd, I'd like to hope that it still provides that for you. But, um, but of course, like what does is, what is magic art mean to you and what does illustration mean to you now, um, having done it for 30, 30 years? So I'll backtrack to why I call this my magic life is because I genuinely feel like I've had a magical life and I've slipped that word in there to be relevant well done. Um, because I honestly feel in fact if I do a in this building right now if you think about it there's art and there's gaming and how cool is that and then there's in the middle there's you lot who are gamers and interested in art I hope anyway wouldn't be here but how wonderful when Richard Garfield and Peter Atkinson designed the game 30 years ago. Yeah, 30. <laughs> so yeah, 31. Like 31. Sure. And I've been doing this for 27 years. But how cool is it that over there there's art and there's gaming and there's the synergy of the two. And I don't think that's achieved anywhere else. Because mm. in my profession, I know quite a few um, fine artists and very wonderful painters who don't get to do what I do, which is fly around the world, um, um, stay at lovely hotels and meet lovely people like you, and I've met a lot of you. And it's a magical thing, and it's all happened through this game, Magic the Gathering. Yeah. And it's incredible. And um, I'd like to segue onto my health, because um, I've all my life had chronic fatigue syndrome, which when I was young, wasn't diag a diagnosable condition. You were just implied as being weak because I was aware when I was a kid in South Wales, you had to play rugby. Yeah. It's basically loads of men or large boys running around in shorts, pushing each other to the ground. And I didn't like that. It didn't feel right. It was very, stop it, stop shoving me to the ground. You. I was going to swear again. <laughs> so again, the only thing I did that was anything vaguely cool was art. But when I was um, young, I always used to feel tired. And in those days, they just would call you weak. And people used to say to me, man up. And my girlfriend in the 70s said to me, John, you must be strong. And I used to feel so ashamed because we do live in a day and age where whatever your orientation is or your however you are, we live in a world that's very inclusive now. So uh, the world is a lot kinder and loving and there are therapists and everything's a lot kinder. In the 60s and the 70s, it's a bit more, you know, there were men and women more. So I grew up feeling quite ashamed because I wasn't strong. So. When I started to establish myself as an artist, I became very aware that I wasn't quite like other people in so much as I felt unwell all the time. So a lot of my artwork has been driven by fear. And it sounds like a confessional, but when I noticed out in the 80s or the early 90s, I was diagnosed as having depression. And then 10 years after that, no, five years, after, five years after that, they diagnosed chronic fatigue syndrome. So finally I had a label 
a reason, they still don't know how to cure me, but I've spent most of my life in pain and pain is a strange partner in life because if you're in pain, your whole body is in fight or flight mode. It's very hard to relax. Can we pause on that green painting with the arch? So I noticed that when I was working on pieces, because this was a, um, a John Avon art play mat, mm. I started to realize that I was in a position to maybe communicate the fact that being with your darkness, in the end you have no choice because if you're suffering from depression or anxiety and you don't feel well, um, as horrible as that is, like in that book, The Power of Now by Eckhart Toller, which was written about two decades ago, saying yes to what is, is in the end, we have to say yes to what is. So this, this painting, again, it shows the darkness, but it shows the light. And um, this painting really is a very cathartic example of the darkness in the end, I've learned, is part of me, and it's the driving force to travel towards lightness. And some people think it's wrong to be in pain and suffer and have a negative state of mind. Well, it's not nice, but it's not wrong, because it, it is. And I've had to learn to embrace my darkness. And one of the things I'd like to say can I? Of course, please. One of the most wonderful methodologies that I've found to survive being me is um, Anthony Waters, who's a Magic the Gathering artist. He's a great dear friend of mine. He, um, we've talked from the heart for many years, and I really wanted to start my own work. When I started my own work, I was aware that I wanted each drawing to look cool so I couldn't start my own work because I wanted to look cool. So Anthony said in his very low American accent, which I'm not going to do, he said, John, I give you permission to do bad drawings. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, just draw the idea. Don't think about how it looks. If it looks terrible, that doesn't matter. It's, a, it's a, an expression of what, you want to, what wants to come out. So I got a an exercise book, no, a notepad with a lovely fountain pen. And I was doing notes and I was doing drawings, which did look very bad, but they were the, I got the idea down on paper. And then the more I drew my ideas, then my skills came in. Yeah. So I could separate out, trying to look cool, I think I'm John Avon, this looks terrible. <laughs> so when I did my own work, which I've been working on for about eight years now, which I've not shown anyone, they started through doing bad drawings. And where am I going with this? I'm going in the direction that if anyone struggles and someone, you might say to yourself, I'm not an artist, I'm not a writer, I'm not a musician, I'm not a creative person. I would say that's completely rubbish because when you were a child, you did all these things. I mean, virtually everyone out there drew pictures when we were young, yes? Yeah. Yes. So you can do that again. You have my permission to draw again. I love it. And you can write. You can write your first novel. You can play guitar. You can rock and roll. Yeah. Because there is no one stopping you. The only thing that's stopping you is the baggage, the idea that you've been told by someone that you're not that. So my... My process, which I think is wonderful, and I'm not sponsored by journals and fountain pens, I really recommend if, if ever you just want to play and have fun is to get a notebook and write down your dreams. And if you want to be, if you don't have to have a goal, you just start. In fact, on my mobile, yeah. I came up with a great phrase. I can find right now, which sure. is, please don't throw your dreams away just because you're too afraid to start. That's really poetic. It's, it's very lovely. cool. Yeah, lovely.
Wonderful. So, <laughs> what do I mean by that? If you are someone who's always wanted to do X, Y, Z, there's no one, there's no hierarchy up there in there or anywhere telling you you can't. Yep. And the main thing is, because I've had people saying to me for years, I want to be an illustrator, but I'm too scared and I've shown my work and people say it's, I was going to say that swear word again. And what I say, and I'd say to all of you, is that um, when you start your dreams, don't show it to anyone for ages. <laughs> do it for yourself. Yeah. And do, if you're going to do a series of paintings, do about five or six of them, then show them to someone. Yeah, sure. If you're going to write an opera <laughs> or something to change the world, just hold off getting the other person's approval. Do it for yourself because if at the end of your life you didn't make it and you weren't whatever, it's the journey that matters. Yes, of because, course. Because what you don't want to end up being is one of those people at the end of your life thinking, why didn't I? And the reason why people don't realize their dreams is because they're too afraid to start. So please start now. <laughs> don't start tomorrow. <laughs> it's a great message. This yeah. is now. I think um, a successful illustrator like Anthony Waters and yourself saying that to just embrace bad drawing and draw poorly mm. for a long time is a mm. great message. I have one last question for you, John, as we wrap up. And this is something we didn't rehearse. I just want to know, um, does art still bring you joy? I mean, it, it is obviously therapy and, it's, uh, and it helps um, with anxiety and imposter syndrome. But do you still find uh, that when you open up the tablets if, or, or a sketchbook, um, that there is still a little bit of that, that spark that we saw at the very beginning. There was, and it sprung through what Anthony said. When I, now when I'm relaxing, I'm always drawing. So how wonderful is that? It's because I did the bad drawings, I'm now doing quite cool drawings. <laughs> and also, I, d I don't want to throw the baby out of the bathwater. When I get asked to do a commission, and I've got over the, oh dear, how am I going to do this moment? There is a moment of excitement when I get it together and there's a huge moment of excitement at the end when it is going off. I'm always scared stiff that the art director will like it. Always, every time it's like <laughs> send. <laughs> and so for about three days I'm scared stiff of the approval coming through because you are only as good as your last job. Yeah. You literally are and that's what I can see various friends out there who I know are artists and it, you are literally only as good as your last job which is really annoying of course I wish it was easier <laughs> than that <laughs> but do you but you must still enjoy the actual process right aside from all the approvals I enjoy it when it's going well great <laughs> it's not going well I'm scared I'm yeah <laughs> I'm just being honest with you Sam good good that's fine that's great um well, I think we would like to conclude here. One more time, so much thanks. Thank you so much, John Avon. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Next time, I hope we are, uh, <laughs> hope we can jump on stage maybe with a guitar so we feel a little bit safer, you know? Can I hide <laughs> Play some bad you? music together. That'd be fun, right? Really bad music, <laughs> yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, so John obviously will be here for the rest of the day um, doing signings uh, right over there, of course, and he's happy to meet and speak with you. So um, that's where we'll be. I have a signing myself at 2 o'clock. Thank you again once more for joining, and I uh, hope you have a great Sunday. All right. Thank you. That's it.